Okay, hello and welcome back to Build with Joy. I am really excited today to introduce you to my friend Cynthia of Oots Threads. Oots means good in Maya Quiche, one of the 21 Maya languages spoken in Guatemala. And we partner with Maya Quiche weavers to create everyday use products that tell a story about the culture that they come from. And we create fair paying jobs. You have with Oots Threads, you have a direct connection to the weavers. Uh, you have you know where your money is going. Um, and yeah, you're supporting uh, Latino owned business. I'm really excited to finally share your story with more people because since the first time we reached out, I was so blown away with what you were doing. And I didn't even realize like why this is something that we needed. And also was excited that you are working with Guatemalans. So I would love for you to introduce yourself a little bit. Where are you from? Let's start there. All right. Uh, so I'm from the Bay Area. My family is actually from Mexico. I'm first gen, uh, born and raised in the Bay Area. Um, and yeah, so I started Oots Threads about three years ago. I really got pulled in because of social entrepreneurship. And I started off studying social work. And then I realized there were some elements missing to it. And I found it in business. And so I decided I wanted to to do some social entrepreneurship. And I learned, I even learned what that was like not that long ago. I didn't know that that was a thing. And I had always liked business. Uh, I just didn't know that you could do business for good and to work with people and still do some form of social, social work. And so when I really found that out, I was just like, this is where it's at for me. Um, and then I got the amazing opportunity after grad school to go work with Las Tejedoras in Guatemala. And with I I loved it. I had an amazing time. I lived in Chichicastenango uh, for a year, um, got dropped into a community uh, where I didn't speak the language. They speak, speak mostly Quiche. And, uh, you know, people speak Spanish. I speak Spanish. And um, so I got to meet the women and work alongside them in business development and just kind of figure out how we can make their products marketable in the U.S. and how do we get them to receive more money for their product, right? So so um, I realized all of, about all of the exploitation and I mean, they told me a lot about all of the exploitation, even our relationship and like the trust building was so hard because they're like, yeah, we know about people that come from other countries and ask us to build things. So I was like, no, I really I'm not I'm not here to make money off of you. I want to help you build your build your product. You already have an existing product. I'm just trying to help you make that product marketable in the U.S. because a lot of times what had ended up happening was they would be they would have these like gorgeous textiles um, but they would be a weepil and you know so uh, we'd be like a traditional blouse in the form of a traditional blouse um, and I mean it's beautiful but I don't find a lot of use to it right so there's not much that I can do with that so I'm probably not going to buy it from them and and or maybe some of the products you know um they didn't have the the quality that I was looking for and the small details that one doesn't even think about until you're actually looking to spend your money somewhere, right? And so um, so I just, you know, I worked alongside them to help them figure out what they already had, what they already existed, uh, and to create it, you know, U.S. marketable, something that we could use here with the quality that is um, – exportable and and that we can charge good money for. I found it really interesting when you said you have a social work background, but realize you can still do social work in a way in in entrepreneurship. What was that that moment or like those things that you noticed that you could still help and have an impact with business? Because I think a lot of the times, especially in our communities, we kind of are just like oh, business, like money hungry, capitalism's evil, which like accurate. But how do we, you know, like the the upside, right? Like how we're using it to the advantages of our, our communities and be able to empower and uplift it. Like what areas did you see that potential in? Of course, money can be used as a as a tool for evil and capitalism being evil. But, you know, everything in balance. Mm -hmm. is is I mean everything needs balance essentially right. like when it becomes a problem is because it's out of out of balance right the greed the 
Um, and then, so I, I mean, I've had that concept too forever of like money being evil. And honestly, that's what I'm working on or I've been working on for years is mm -hmm. shifting my mindset to see money as a tool rather than some, something that can be hurtful. Because if, if you really like in the circumstances that I had in Guatemala, I realized that if we can figure out a way so these women could make their own money, uh, for one, it's, and I, and I hate to say the word empowering, it feels very like, I don't know, it's, it's savior-ish sometimes, right? And, and it is, and so yeah. I like to say self-empowering because I'm not doing anything, I'm not doing anything yes. for you, you're doing it for you, I'm just bringing the tools, right? Like I have this, I have this connection because I have the passport that I have and the privileges that I have. What I'm doing is I'm bringing my knowledge of, of like a market that's outside of yours. And I have that, uh, I have that ability to ship. I have the ability to take out loans for my business. I have the ability to do a lot of things that you're not able to do in your country. And what I'm doing is I'm bringing those to you and you're bringing what you have because I, oh, okay. I, so I think part of what's uncomfortable mm -hmm. about empowering is the power dynamic, right? Is it gives it to the person who's um, doing the empowering when in reality, everybody brings something, but I think the word empowering assumes that you don't have something to bring and I'm bringing it to you, right? So it's like, um, because that's something that I really got when I was working there is that these women have this amazing knowledge. Like, yo no se tejer. I don't, girl, I don't know how to sew on a button. <laughs> so, so they have this amazing ancestral knowledge of weaving and it's an art. It's like really complex. It uses math. It uses, um, you know, color combinations that the color combination game is hard in what the, in Chichi Castanango where I was working at, uh, like they do it really well. And so, uh, so I just feel like it's, we're all bringing something to the table. We're all working together to build something together as como mujeres, como Latinas, um, and like building something in a system that wasn't made for us to build in. Like we're, we're, there aren't those spaces for us. So we're building our own and I'm going to do it in collaboration with these tejedoras. But business was that tool for, um, for that opportunity to work with these women and be like, hey, you know, you have these products, I have this knowledge, let's combine it together, creates an opportunity for them to make their own money, to not be dependent on, you know, maybe their partners and their communities, uh, to be able to, because a lot of times women are the ones who are paying for their children's education, um, for, uh, you know, advancing their community, um, that it gives them that that opportunity to do that for themselves and their community. And so that in itself, creating that job is a form of, you know, social work in a, in a very distant, like, that's what I enjoy about it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, that fulfills me and knowing that we're us working together and us bringing each our own things to the table. We're building something together where you have your benefit and you did that. And, and along with my support and, Likewise, right? It's like a, a mutual relationship. Yeah, I think that's the, the that's one of the reasons that um, after college, I went to go work with uh, Grameen America because that was the whole philosophy of Muhammad Yunus was, you know, with the, the micro loans, but was really to get women to start businesses because they're like, it's not really about this generation. It's about the generations after, right? Like if you have, if you empower a woman, she empowers her whole family, right? Like right. she's able to create jobs for herself, her family, and not have to be dependent or even in like financial abuse situations, right? Which unfortunately is very real for women, especially like women in Latin America and in our communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I find that amazing. And you know, for people who are maybe just realizing like what social entrepreneurship is and, you know, you actually sell a product, right? Like Oots Threads. Where where did that idea kind of come from? And, you know, what is it that, that you all create? Okay. So I learned about social entrepreneurship through this brand. I went to this con this festival and there was a company that um, bought the pockets from, from women in Peru. And I was like, that's amazing. You can sell a product and, you know, give well-paying jobs to somebody. And on top of that, like you're teaching people something about who this person is or the community they come from, depending on the privacy of, of, uh, how much privacy you want to, uh, 
uh, how much you want to share, right? So, mm-hmm. um, so I thought, you know, you learn, you you support somebody, and you have this amazing product. It's like a win all the way around, right? So that was my first introduction to social entrepreneurship, and you know, after grad school, I got this job. Came, I spent a year in Guatemala, and came back, and I wanted to start a business. Um, I was terrified. I was like, should I do this? Can I do this? Where would I do this? How would I do this? <laughs> so my bo- I was blessed that my boss was like, hey, I'm going to um, – I'm going to have to close down the, the like the part of the nonprofit where you were working in. And oh. so, yeah, I have to close that down. And I was like, oh, damn, that sucks. She's like, but how do you feel about starting a business? And I was like, well, that's terrifying. Um, <laughs> but she, you know, she encouraged me and, she, and I already have the relationship with the women, which I feel is like huge part of the battle. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that relationship building is like 80% of the work is like making sure that there's a a well working relationship with with um las mujeres and like production and everything that's like a huge part of it right so i already had that and so it just kind of encouraged me like you know what now or never let's do it that moment that you started everything right like kind of how you you got into it but also you know i think one of the biggest things is you see the products that you have on oots and if anyone wants to go look at it on oots threads and you can check the show notes there's amazing beautiful a new collection so you look at Oots threads and it doesn't look like just any traditional you know like you you see a lot of this where it's just kind of like the cutout um textiles and whatnot especially in Guatemala and I remember when I saw yours I immediately was like wow these are gorgeous like they look very different and very modern and chic and I was really surprised to know that they're they're made custom right and there's because it was there's there's a lot of sacredness to the design. Could you speak a little bit more about that and just the textile industry in general and like what you are all doing to make it more fair and equitable? Okay, so um, I'm going to drop, do a little name drop in here. My friend um, Aaron has a video called Unraveling Traditions. So um, in the textile industry, and I didn't know this until I started working in textiles, but um, so it turns out that a lot of times when someone is buying something in Guate and even online and in, in like these exporting businesses, a lot of times what ends up happening is starting from the beginning, someone goes around buying used huipiles um, for really cheap and to go sell them at a market. So that's very custom, right? So somebody sells it at a market, they bought it from somebody in poverty uh, who is really desperate for this money for maybe a couple bucks. Mind you, we be let's make a real, like take months to make. So we're not even talking about the labor of the person, but also like the material used. It takes up a lot of, 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 hilo, of, of thread and months and months to make. So someone comes by taking an, uh, advantage of the opportunity and buys a lot of we from in different communities. Right. And they sell them at the market. What people do que es muy costumbre, is to, to go and buy whippy list from the market, no idea who the actual who the actual artist is. And so the person who made it doesn't get any profit when this person buys it, cuts it up and puts it on a backpack or puts it on a purse. Um, so that, you know, and then then a lot of times these person people will market it as, you know, helping um, weavers in Guatemala, but in reality they don't know who wove that piece. It's it's feels of a bit um a bit tricky and a bit um because I don't I'm not trying to knock people who do that because I know people who do that but like it's just not it's not totally helpful for the weaver themselves right it's not having that direct connection Mm -hmm. and direct impact and so I when I went to Guate I had the direct connection with the tejedoras and we were working um, with them to create designs. And so that's why every piece that you see from Oots Threads was created for the company. And, you know, none of our pieces are cut up. The person who made the textile gets the profit from the sale of the product. And so it's that direct connection to the tejedora. And it's like really, really intense work, hours and hours. Like I'll tell you a piece, uh, this big of brocade takes eight hours to make. And so 
And so it's really important that if we have that opportunity to go direct to the weaver as a consumer as well, to be able to give that money directly to the person who is creating because let's be real, that's the part that makes it amazing, incredible, gorgeous. Yeah. Right? I tried to do some macrame. Oh, it took it. me hours. And people were just like, how much is it? And I was like, I am charging an arm and a leg because this took me a lot of effort. So like, I and I think I reached out to you because I was like, yo, this is a lot of work, right? Like when you actually do it, you're just like, oh my God, like the mental energy too. Like I was trying to relax, but you're also trying to be like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, you know? And it's a lot of like calculations in your head that that moment I really appreciated like the artistry behind this. And I like pulled up my Oots bag and I was like, wow, <laughs> like in, in all of this to be able to create that, which is just mind blowing. And I think we tend to take these things for granted, right? Because we don't have that connection to who made it, right? Or even understanding that and understanding how it's part of like a bigger supply chain, right? Um, and even like practices that could be exploitative at times. Right, exactly. And um, yeah, that's so I, I will drop uh, my friend's video who if anyone yes. wants to like learn more about it, it's called it's called Recycled Weepiles, Unraveling Traditions. And it, she talks like really clearly about how that whole process happens normally and how, you know, that leads to exploitation. And when you buy something, that's a lot of times why it's so cheap, you know, because it costs the person maybe five, maybe let's say maybe 10, 20 bucks to get that weepy. And they just cut it up and made four or five bags out of it. And then what they really paid for was the production of maybe like if it's leather, um, the the leather worker. And it's great. That's why I'm saying I'm not trying to knock it because it's great that you're creating jobs for leather workers, but it's also a little bit a little bit misleading that it seems like the weaver is getting something out of it. Uh, but in reality, right. if it's and a lot of people might not even know, right? right? Like, oh, I didn't know that the weavers weren't getting it. Some guy sold it to me at the market and I was like, cool, right. helping you, right? <laughs> right. And you wouldn't be cool with like somebody selling you an amazing painting that they bought off of somebody else for like 10 bucks and selling it to you for a hundred, right? Like you'd be like, I mm -hmm. want to give that hundred to the artist. Why would I give it to you? Um, and right. And so that's the, that's the, the argument with recycled with Billis. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, the key points that you keep saying artist, right? Like this isn't just like, oh, I'm not just, you know, a seamstress or anything like this is living art because each, you know, if you want to, like the textiles are really important in the Mayan culture in Guatemala, correct? Right. And so the art even, it tells you something about the culture that it comes from. For example, um, and I don't pretend to like have super authentic designs on my bags because I am not a Mayan woman. Uh, you know, I helped them create designs um, and I, you know, I collaborated with them in creating them, but we were also trying to go for like a little bit different touch than anything that's in the market, right? Or anything that's um, that's available at the moment. And so what we did was create a designs that are inspired by and, mm -hmm. um, and that they but they also have a connection to the cultura quiche. So quiche is one of the regions in Guatemala. It's also a language. It's also um, an indigenous uh, ethnicity. And so there are 21 Maya languages in existence. And, you know, every each one has its own style of clothes, uh, way of practicing Maya spirituality, uh, language. It's not like because they're all Maya languages, like they don't even understand, it's, they're not even similar at all, right? Like, so you can't understand someone from an hour away. It's a totally different language. Um, and of course, as outsiders, we don't see how very varied it is. Um, but yeah, but it is really, really different. And so from one region to another. And so when I was there, you know, I started learning about uh, what does, what do people dress like in Solola versus uh, Chichi Castenango versus um, somewhere in Zacatepeques. And so, you know, I remember one story was of, uh, I went with Lucia, one of the women, the weaving uh, Las Mujeres Tejedoras, and we went to this training that she had to go to and a woman walks in the room and she goes, oh, you know, like that woman from Solola. And I was like, oh, you know her? And she's like, no, I don't know her. I just know because of the way that she's dressed. Look at her skirt and look at this and look at that. And it took me some while, 
some time to like fully understand um, that they ver- like it varies so um, so much, and that's how you know they take pride in their in their region. In Chichicastenango, they wear las mujeres tienen like sun rays around their neck, and that's very specific to Chichi. And Lucia would say things like, you know, I walk in somewhere really proud, knowing that everyone is aware of where I'm from, like I'm repping my my community. Oh, that's so cool. I didn't know that. And so we have sun rays on some of the bags. That's the Kihtat line, which means father, son. And so um, the textiles, also the intent, because I'm like a, a big old culture nerd that I love to like share that. Oh, no, that's <laughs> so cool. Cause it's like, you're not just like, you know, it's not just like a bag. It's like, you're wearing, you're wearing history in the making. Right. It's their pride. It's their, you know, like the, the Ishkanul line is of volcanoes. It's like a bird's eye view of volcanoes. Oh, that one's my favorite one. You the have the bag. <laughs> yeah, <you> have <laughs> I love that one too. And, and if you like one day, a dream of mine is to be able to hold you know, non-white savior. Well, obviously I can't do the white savior part. <laughs> Thankfully, like, I don't do that shit. Uh, but just savior in general, like the savior idea of like tours. I don't like mm-hmm. them. I've seen them and I'm just like, oh, why don't you bring some dignity with yourself to the community? Like show show these how amazing this culture is. And so one of my dreams is to one day, you know, hold um, tours of the of the region because it's gorgeous like you're driving down the road the highway and on to your left is this gorgeous volcano huge volcano a woman sitting in front of you with her wipil uh with, that's like so colorful and and delicately embroidered and then the language you hear the language um you know just everything combined is a, it's an amazing experience and so one day like the Oots Threads line is just like a taste of that. But my hope is to one day be like, oh, so you bought a bag. Let's go. <laughs> let's go see, you know, let's yes. go meet these women that... I see the ad campaign already. <laughs> it's like, let's go. I want to say the vagas to Guatemala. And I really like- <laughs> miss it. I mean, we were supposed to be there. But... No, but I love this. And, and you know, one of the things that we haven't touched on much is... That when you talk about working in collaboration with the tejedoras, you truly mean it, right? You are working in a co-op model. And for anybody that's listening, what does what's the what is a co-op model, and how is that different than traditional businesses? Um, so the women themselves have a co-op that existed before I met them, and they mm-hmm. are the first co-op that I've seen in action and how things run. And really what it means is collaboration um, and using everybody's skills to the most, to their, to their fullest potential and like giving everybody roles. So everybody is in charge of something. Um, And then everybody is responsible for, um, for contributing. Um, And so there's a lot of meeting involved, meetings involved because it includes everybody's voice. That's one of the big Mm. things is that, Everybody has a role. There is not one person in charge. It's not like top down. Um, It's very uh, lateral. And everybody has a piece of the puzzle that they're in charge of. And everybody's voice counts and everybody is invited. And so, you know, it, it means a lot of collaboration. It means a lot of, from my experience in working with the women, is that a lot of asking people to step up if they want to be a part of a cooperative is you have to be an active member in in, um, you know, contributing in some way, shape or form. And so that was my first experience within it. And then I came back um, to Oakland and there's an organization called Prospera Co-ops, which I love, and they support Latina women in creating co-ops. And so, you know, I worked with them as a consultant, but then I was also like, your program is amazing. Amazing. I want to be a part of it. And I did their programming. And so it teaches a lot about, you know, uh, what do co-ops look like? What do they need? And, um, you know, is it really for you? Because it's not, you know, like it's not for everyone. Some people work better in direct leadership um, and like having, you know, top down leadership and other people are so involved all the time that they're that they prefer a co-op model where, you know, they're expected to come to all the meetings and contribute their 
two cents every time. And so it's a lot like each person has one vote in a co-op and it's very democratic. And there, there are some in existence here in the Bay area, like rainbow co-op. Uh, it's a grocery store and, and there's um, ours Mendy, which is a bakery co-op. And, you know, in speaking to people there, I get a lot of the same vibes that I didn't want. They're just like, it's really hard because it's hard to get a lot of people to agree on one, agree on one thing. It's really hard and personalities and needs and all this, like everybody has one, right? Everybody has their own need and their own input. And so it's really hard, but at the end of the day, everybody has a sense of ownership. So I'm not like, oh, clocking out at five o'clock, I'm out, which is, let's be real, which is very, um, and common American. and fair, right? Like, cause it's not, you don't have that sense of ownership in right. a co-op. You're like, that's my business. Like on top of mm-hmm. right, I didn't say that part, did I? You, you, you have a vote, you have to be involved and you also get a percentage of their earnings. So mm-hmm. you don't get, you get your paycheck plus whatever the earnings are, you're getting your part. So you're really so you're, like, you're rather than investing capital, you're investing like your time and labor, right? To get that money back, essentially. Uh, you are some co-op. It depends on the co-op model, because, again, oh, okay. this is everybody has their own. Like when you're creating your co-op, like when you're creating your LLC, you have to define the terms. And I'm forgetting the name of it, but there's the name of it. I'll drop it to you at some point. Um, But there's uh. Like you have to define the terms of like how to come in, how to come into the co-op. I know like Mandela co-ops is another grocery store here. And I've heard, um, I've heard it from different um, co-ops. Like maybe you have to pay a certain amount and then you get paid back or, um, but eventually you, every year when there's like a, where there's like a profit made, you're getting a cut of that. So not just your paycheck, but also the cut of the business's profit. Um, and I ah. and I don't want to simplify this because it's really yeah. really complicated, really complicated. It's, it sounds a lot more complicated than you're making it seem. And on that note, you know, talking about you know, people might be like, "Yay, it's a business!" You know, I have a cool bag. I'm working with cool people, and I'm rolling in the dough now, and I'm all set, right? <laughs> and that's clearly how business works. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so being real, like, what are some of the lessons that you had to learn the hard AF way? Some of the biggest lessons I've learned from from doing a business is, well, for one, is the taking care of my numbers. That has been a painful and amazing experience in that, like, I'm really being empowering myself into being able to understand what's going on, uh, but it has been painful. Um, and you're just like, amazing. <laughs> and I think the lesson in that is like, when something scares you, do it, right? So like, don't yes. shy away from the things that scare you the most. Like your taxes. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty important. Um and yeah, so I've, I've shied away from it this whole time. And I've just been like later. And now I'm like, I can't do later because I need funding and I need, you know, I need to be taken to the next level and I need my numbers to be in order. And so I'd say, don't shy away from things at all. Like if you can identify that it scares you jump head first and like figure out what are the resources available. That's the, one of the things that has helped me the most is like, figure out what resources you have in your area because, you know, we're blessed that we can, that there are so many nonprofits um, that support even nationally, um, not just locally, but do you have any that you recommend? Absolutely. Um, There is start small, think big. They do free legal and um, marketing support. Um, They were helping me identify whether I was going to be an LLC or a, or a, or an S corp. Um, and then, you know, they did some free marketing with me and then there's also the SBA small business administrator that's national, you know, um, they, and they have classes, they have lawyers, they have so right. many things. I did their, their course two and a half years ago, I think three almost maybe. Yeah. And they're, and for the most part, they're free 
free to cheap. Yeah, and it was in the library. So, like, fund the libraries, people. Um. <laughs> For sure. Definitely. Um, and then I've told you about Prospera, but that's just the Bay Area. Um, and then there's also Optima Business Boot Camp. Like, I've Centro Community Partners. That's these two are both Bay Area. Um, and so I was just always, always getting into all of the things. And so that leads me to another lesson, which is identify what you're doing first <laughs> and then work backwards because I have the tendency to want to do all the things all the time. And it just really, I would drown myself and I'd just be like, I'm done. I'm walking away from this. That's a very <laughs> common thing for entrepreneurs. You know, we're the type of people that are just like excited and we want to solve problems. And we're just like, I want to change the world. And it's funny that I, you even mentioned that because I was like, even this podcast, like I've been wanting to do it for a year. And then I was like, mm. oh, I also have basic founders and I also want to do workshops. And then you end up spreading yourself so thin. <laughs> right. right. Because And then yeah. you could have a genuine interest in all of it. But is it working towards my goal? You know, right. Yes. I would always think like, I just want to do all the things, but then I would end up doing some things not so well. And then I, I was just like, I have to identify what exactly I'm working towards zero in on that and forget the rest because I could learn about marketing and learn about bookkeeping, bookkeeping at any time. But if I do them both at the same time, I'm not going to get any of it. So that's what I would always do. So so yeah, like identifying what is your your goals from the from early on and also to be fair with yourself that like they are going to change, but at least at least you know what they are and you know what is changing versus just kind of going with the flow and and I know as entrepreneurs like that's the thing that we do, right? Like we're really good at just, you know, taking chances and going with the flow. It's it's part of the entrepreneurial spirit, but identifying early on what it is that you're doing and why and really, really understanding your why is going to keep you from like overwhelming yourself at times. Yes. Oh, my God. I love this because I, I always I recently have been trying to explain things as easy as possible. And literally, I have this whole equation that I go over with people. And I'm like, we're going to think solutions first and then identifying the problems and obstacles and build a process around that. Um, and speaking on that point, what are some of, you know, the any like process or system that you realize that you needed to put in place to make your life easier as a business owner? Um, I, I definitely say my time, creating systems for my time was one of the things that has helped me stay sane, um, especially right now during the pandemic where you can work from home so you can literally do whatever you want whenever you want. Um, and, and so I have a full-time job and then I would, you know, I would have all of these things that I had to do. And so I'm working all day anyway, right? Like I'm working and I have a six-year-old. So I'm working all day. Um, and then doing Oots Thread stuff after work. And then I want to, you know, build volcanoes with my six-year-old. And then I want to, you know, you know, eat at some point. And so all these things. And so eating I, is so important. At some point, right? It's, it, it would be surprising to most people how many like build, like people who are building and founders like literally forget to eat all the time. I forget to eat all the time. It's really bad. It's almost like everything I had to learn how to like block out and make time for. Like How to be an adult. <laughs> This time I'm going to do this. And at this time I'm going to do that. And so then I felt more in control. Time block. No, but on the time thing, I think that's a really important thing that we have to remember as business owners is that your time is so valuable, right? So it's not about, you know, just trying to make more time. That's impossible. It's trying to be strategic with the time that you have. So it's Absolutely. funny because you're like, I seem crazy because I have this entire like schedule and everything. I'm like, girl, you have not seen my crazy schedule. Like I have, it's color coded. There's blocks of chunks and time in there and it's never going to be perfect. And I think it's funny that we were talking about this, trying to schedule this. It was just like, oh, we had our lives like organized. And then it's like someone in our family just popped up because right. we're Latina and, <laughs> and I was so happy. Schedules. Right. And I was so happy that I could just tell you that and that you were like, I get it. I get it. It sucks. And you can't say yeah, no. And it's, there's no yeah, way you can say no, don't come over, right? So you're like, I right, have to. Right, because they're already there. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, no. 
<laughs> right. And it's all these like little unexpected things. Um, and I think that's one of the, the things as an entrepreneur of color, especially as a Latino entrepreneur, that like there are these like little tiny quirks, right, that most people don't understand. And it's just so ingrained. And it's hard for us, I think, sometimes to adapt traditional American work ethic, right, to our very values and family driven and community driven ethic, right? And, you know, I think that's something that we've learned to adapt. And, you know, kind of on the last couple of things, you're, oh, you gave us so many gems, so much. I literally was taking notes and was like, this is an amazing sound clip. Like, this is amazing. Um, so thank you for sharing what you built so far. I know we we connected years ago and you've grown so much, right? You've cha- You've really impacted many lives. And even like you telling us like the story, I was just like, wow, I really like do have a piece of history, right? Like in my wardrobe which is amazing and I always I love it it's beautiful it's blue and the other thing though is how how can we help you right you gave us so much amazing information what's one way that we can support you or tell you you know be able to to help you in any way uh so I will be having a product launch you'll yes I know I'm so excited this has been years in the making I've been wanting this since I launched my first round of products I'm like what's next three years later um it's been an amazing journey and I would love for all of you to join in in following us on social media at Oots Threads U-T-Z Threads um and and following us on social media and sharing and, you know, buying your yourself or your cousin or your friend or your neighbor <laughs> a nice textile product. You're all going to love it. They're really beautiful. Um, we're combining this time leather and textile. And we're, leather. it's so beautiful. Like, uh, it's so beautiful. Every time I've shown someone that, because I'm horrible at, like, keeping secrets of something so amazing, I'm just like, you want to see something cool? <laughs> Everyone's just, like, shook at how gorgeous this stuff is. Um, and then it's really, like, the the story behind it is really exciting. I'm working, I'm collaborating with a Guatemalan designer. Her name is Stephanie Richmond. Uh, we have never met in person, so we're internet business partners. <laughs> and, and uh, we, I bought one of her bags when I was in Watte. I was like, I love her work. And I just decided to connect with her. And we've been doing work back and forth for years, right? So she helped me do my first website. Um, she's helped me a bit with social recently. And, um, and then she did the designs. So a uh, really cool story there is that she had a textile business at some point a couple years ago. Um, and, you know, she was missing the element of having the direct connection to the weavers. And then, you know, I I love the products that we have, um, but we wanted to go in a new direction. And so she has this, you know, amazing eye and amazing talent. And so we combined our skills together and, and to make this line of products. And it's just really going to be really going to be gorgeous. So if you could follow us. Yes, and they are. I did get a sneak peek. So it's gorgeous. I feel like it's grown up with you too, right? Like, and it's very like elegant, but classy and chic. So I'd like to I, think I'm really excited. <laughs> I'd like to think that that's where I am right now. <laughs> it's growing with me, <laughs> but it's, yes. yeah, it's, it's a lot of, yeah, it truly does feel like the energy that, that is what Oots Threads is turning into um, as we've grown and collaborated and made m- new business partners and realize what works, what doesn't in production and and working with the Hedoras and Guatemala. There's been so much learning and we've grown and so have the new products. And so, yeah, everyone's going to love them. So follow, follow us, join us. Yes. And any way, you know, if people want to work with you, collaborate with you, how can they approach you? Um, well, we're on on Instagram at Oots Threads, um, always on there and genuinely always excited about collaborations. If it feels like everybody's on the same wavelength as far as, you know, what we value, um, you know, the kind of uh, results we want to see in our work, if that aligns, it's I'm all for it. I'm really excited 
to meet new people all the time. Also a really cool bonus of business is meeting all these amazing people. That's how we met. We met through the DMs. (laughs) (laughs) You included. You get to meet all these really cool people and be like, hey, you're dope. I'm dope. Let's do something. And Right. And I think especially in like the impact space, right? Because people genuinely care about what they're doing and they're passionate about it. And they're actually making a difference in their communities. And, you know, if folks want to learn more about, you know, what, what can they ask you questions of if they have questions on something? I'd be more than happy to talk to anyone looking to start a textile business. Um, it is, it is. I mean, on top of starting a business, it's the textile industry is a whole other ball game because we're talking about um, textiles are, you know, they're being created in another country, um, and we're talking about human relationships. We're talking about cross national relationships. Um, you don't do business here in the U.S. the same way you do in Guatemala. If I start a business call the way that I, I started meeting here in the U.S., people would be like, so rude. She didn't even say good morning. She didn't ask me how my family is. <laughs> like, you have. Oh, my God. I had this issue when I stayed at my grandma's. I just, like, would walk outside and people were like, hmm, tan creída. And I was like, I'm from New York. Like, we don't acknowledge people. <laughs> and, it's, and so there's a lot of cultural norms that are, like, the the like bare minimum for somebody to trust you enough to do business with you. And so um, I know that that has its own, its own set of difficulties. And, you know, I'd be more than happy to talk to somebody about like, Hey, I want to start a textile business in this region. Do you have any tips on how to do that or where I should, how I, how I can build trust with the, with the community. And of course that's varies very much per person, right? But like I can give a part of my story and support people in that. And just even being someone to talk to when shit hits the fan, because it will. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yes. And if people want to interview you and get to know more, what can you speak on? Um, I could speak on... For all fellow creators and podcasters. This is one of my favorite people. I highly recommend reaching out to her. (laughs) Oh, right on. That's so sweet. Um, I can speak on you know, creating products in another country. I can speak on exporting. I can speak on um, marketing. I love marketing. Um, I could speak on working in re- working out of the country, um, having relationship, business relationships outside of the country and, you know, managing that. And um, I can speak on, yeah. That's, that's what I got. Well, <laughs> traveling <you're amazing>. the world. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no big deal. You know, I'm just traveling the world while I do this and build a business. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> I'm clearly. <laughs> well, Cynthia, this has been a pleasure. And where can people find your new product line? Um, at utzthreads.com, U T Z threads.com. And I don't think I said this in the beginning. Um, Uts means good in Maya Quiche, one of the 21 Maya languages spoken in Guatemala. And we partner with Maya Quiche weavers to create everyday use products that tell a story about the culture that they come from. And we create fair paying jobs. You have with Uts Threads, you have a direct connection to the weavers. Uh, you have, you know, where your money is going. Um, and yeah, you're supporting, uh, Latino owned business. Yes, and we're all here for the Latina and female-owned businesses, and I'm really excited that you took this time, and we finally got to do this. We finally did an episode. (laughs) (laughs) Only, like, what, three years in the making? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It only took the whole time. Only took a pandemic. It's fine. (laughs) We'll put a pause it here.